Hey there, Paul Mack here. You know, on my last video, Lifting Heavy Objects Without a Tractor, I showed the assembly and use of an old time gin pole for lifting heavy objects. Well, you can find the link for that video in the description below. So if you haven't already seen it, go back and do that sometime today. But following that video, I received several good questions from you, my viewers, about different aspects of operating and assembling the gin pole that we didn't cover in the first video. So today we're going to answer some of those questions, things like what kind of knot I used on the support ropes to keep the gin pole from swaying back and forth. Also, I'm going to show you how to calculate exactly how long your gin pole needs to be for whatever you're doing. All that and more today, so stay tuned. So in my last video, one of the things I did with this gin pole was lift a very long and heavy pole up into position because I'm building a pole barn here and I need that pole to go down into the hole that I dug. So I used the gin pole to lift the pole up. And some of you asked why I go to the trouble of rigging the gin pole uh, just to lift the pole when I could have rigged the come along, the cable, and the anchor tree to lift the pole itself with support ropes and all. And yes, I could have done that instead of connecting the uh, cable to the gin pole here, I could have connected it directly to the pole and then used support ropes to balance it as it went up into the hole. The only thing is I've got several holes uh, dug here and several poles that need lifting. In order to lift each pole, I would have to re-rig the cable to each pole and then use the come along, which as you all know, is it's good, but it's slow in cranking up. And with this setup, all I had to do was set up the gin pole once and I can actually, with the gin pole right where it is right now, can lift several other poles into position without re-rigging the gin pole. It's just a matter of simply putting a rope around each pole, um, putting the block and tackle to each rope and then lifting each pole in place without having to re-rig the gin pole. In fact, I can even get away with lifting some of the poles that aren't uh, right in front of the gin pole providing that my support ropes are good and steady. So you can do a lot with a gin pole just in one position. Now, some of you might be asking, how do you calculate how long a gin pole you're gonna need for whatever you're doing? Well, it's fairly simple and it requires a little bit of simple math. If you've ever heard of the Pythagorean theorem, we use that bit of geometry for setting uh, four corners of a building, making sure they're square or rectangular and not a cockeyed rhombus or whatever. So the Pythagorean theorem can also be used for calculating how long of a gin pole you need. The first thing you do is calculate how high you need your gin pole to be above whatever it is you're lifting. Now, however high you're wanting to lift whatever object you're wanting to lift, you're going to have to add two or three foot, give or take, uh, to that height to account for the length of the block and tackle and securing it to whatever you're lifting. We'll call that A, side A, that's your vertical side. After that, you need to figure how far from that vertical point out do you want the hole that will secure the bottom end of the gin pole. That's your horizontal measurement, so that will be B. So if you know those two measurements, you take A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and C squared would actually be the length of the gin pole from the ground, from the hole that it's resting in, all the way up to above the object that you're wanting to lift. Very easy to calculate, and that will tell you about how long to cut the tree for the gin pole. Now, a few of you had a question about the quilt that I had draped across the cable on the gin pole, and some of you viewers actually answered the question correctly. Uh, I'll just answer it again here. Whenever I'm using a cable and I've got a lot of pressure on that cable, there is a danger occasionally that the cable could snap back and seriously injure me. I don't want that to happen. I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody. A lot of times it's not, however, the cable breaking because if a cable is seriously um, uh, scarred or, or broken, you can see that beginning to unravel. And Cables are really, really strong materials. Several steel wires woven together. They're virtually hard to cut even. What usually happens is the cable comes undone from itself because to hook a hook 
or make a loop on the end of a cable, you have to bend it back around itself and then crimp it down with special made crimps, which you actually mash or bend on there. They're made out of metal or U bolts that you can bolt down onto that loop that holds the hook. So sometimes if that cable is old, you, you might not ever be sure when that uh, loop is gonna come undone. And if it do comes undone under pressure, it'll snap back and really ruin your day. So by draping a heavy quilt or a heavy tarp or canvas or what do you, whatever you have over that cable at a strategic point, should it snap and come loose, that blanket, quilt, or whatever is gonna slow the snapback of it hopefully preventing you from getting hurt at all. At the very least, uh, preventing you from getting hurt as bad as you would have been had there been no quilt on it. Now, a few of you also asked, did my wife know I had one of her good quilts out here uh, draped over my Genpo cable? I very much appreciate your concern over my marital well-being. However, this is not one of her good quilts. There are several quilts in the house that if I had used them, my marriage could be on rough ground at least for a little while, but I didn't use those. This actually came out of my box trailer. It's one of the old quilts, discarded quilts that I use uh, when I go to auctions and wrap things up uh, at, that I buy at auctions, antiques and so forth. Speaking of auctions, you need to watch my show, What I Got at the Auction. A lot of times I'm finding really neat antiques, especially ones that have to do with the farm and I explain why they're good for the farm or historically what they used to be used for on the farm. So make sure you watch my show. It'll be in the link below, what I got at the auction. Now, another viewer mentioned that if I had just put the T-post that hold these support ropes in line with the base of the gin pole or the hole where the base of the gin pole sits, if I had put those in line, there would have been no need to adjust the tension on the ropes as I was lifting the pole. And while Technically, that is true. Uh, if you did it that way, uh, you wouldn't. I would not want to lift the gin pole very high to be able to do whatever I'm doing, because at a certain point, if you lift it too high, it's liable to flop back on over. Especially if you're lifting an object and the load of that object shifts or swings backward, it could cause the whole thing to swing backwards. In my opinion, it's just much better to have three different points at a triangle these two ropes forward of the base of the gin pole so that you have that sturdy position for the gin pole and it, there's no chance it's going to swing backwards. By the way, I want to tell you about a couple of books I have available for sale. The first is called Common Trees and Their Use for the Farm or Homestead. Now this is a book especially for the young farmer who's trying to figure out what tree is used for what, which tree makes a good fence post, which tree is good for making tool handles and so forth. But not only does it tell you what tree is good for what, it also is a field guide so that you can go out into the woods and be able to learn how to identify one tree from another, whether it's winter or summer. I've got pictures of leaves that are very, very clear and I've got pictures of the bark so that you can begin to properly identify what tree is what on your farmer homestead. Common trees and their use for the farmer homestead. The second book is called Building an Old Fashioned Pole Barn. If you on your farm need a building of any type, whether it's a barn or a corn crib or even a smokehouse or even an outhouse, my book Building an Old Fashioned Pole Barn will show you step-by-step -step directions, even if you're not a carpenter. That doesn't matter. If you're just a guy or a gal who needs their own building and you're only one person building it, this book is for you, Building an Old Fashioned Pole Barn. Now, some viewers suggested that a better design than the gin pole would be the use of shear legs. Basically, what that is, is two poles instead of the singular pole. And what the shear legs would do would be to eliminate the need for the two ropes that I adjusted to hold the single gin pole steady. With two legs, obviously, once you lifted it, it'd be very sturdy and it couldn't move. Now, a shear legs design would work for what I was doing in lifting this pole. It would work for several situations if you're lifting an object uh, high in the air. However, uh, you're not really saving any time, so to speak, because instead of having one gin pole, you're gonna have to cut two gin poles, which means two trees you're going to have to haul those two trees around. And this gin pole was plenty heavy for me to haul around. I could do it, but it, it's still a chore. But with the shear legs uh, design, you would have two of those poles 
uh, to worry about. And you are also doubling the weight that the cable has to pull or the come along has to pull, which is not a big deal. And if your come along is strong enough, it can do it. Also keep in mind that you're gonna have to dig two holes for the base of the shear legs to rest in instead of the one hole. You know, in a sense, there's really no work saving method to this. It's just pick your work. What do you wanna do? Dig holes, fell two extra trees, or go to the trouble of rigging the T-post or the stakes with your adjustable ropes. Potater, potater. And then I had another viewer come up with a great idea that would be actually a substitute for either the shear legs or the gin pole, and that would be using just a regular old extension ladder as your gin pole. You would still need to have ropes tied to stakes, securing it so that it doesn't sway back and forth, but you would have two legs of the ladder in holes. I would still dig the holes just so that the ladder doesn't swing out uh, of the hole and it's securely held there. But an extension ladder would be a great option for a gin pole, providing it's not rickety, you know, like my extension ladder is, and providing that extension ladder is hefty enough to hold whatever weight you're intending to lift. Now, several of you asked what type of knot I used to keep tension on the support ropes for the gen pole. Well, there's probably several names for this knot. Every knot has, who knows, two or three different names. This one is commonly called a taut line hitch. Of course, a taut line hitch is good for when you're taking up slack, as in the two ropes, the support ropes for the gen pole. It's also a good knot for uh, tent ropes when you're trying to tighten ropes that are holding your tent or your canvas when you're out camping. It's a perfect knot for that. So here's how you do it. First, you wrap the rope around what it is you're tying off to. In this case, it's the T-post. And then I generally hold it right here with my hand and make a couple of rounds around the main line there, just like that. There, I've gone around it a couple times, and then I go under the main line there and back through the loop right here, and then cinch it up, and basically it looks like this right here. Now, it will slide either direction on this main rope right here, and so you can let slack out of it or take the slack up with it the taut line hitch. By the way, some of you expressed how much you liked the soundtrack in the video I did on lifting heavy objects without a tractor. Well, that tune, along with several others, are tunes for the Farmhands Companion Show that I wrote or arranged and recorded on homemade instruments. You can find out more about that in the link below. You can also find out how to purchase that album called Homemade. Now, some of you expressed how much you hated the music. You disliked it, it annoyed you, and it distracted you from what I was saying. Well, go ahead and buy the album anyway, because we want to make sure that you don't like it or make sure that it annoys you. So, in the description below, look for the link to my album, Homemade.